The hearing will return to order. We now have uh, Dr. Roger Pelkey. I've pronounced it correctly. I see by your name, not by your head nodding. Yeah, you got it. That's a... And uh, then after that, Dr. Spencer. Please proceed, Dr. Pelkey. Yeah, thank you uh, uh, to the senators and to the committee uh, for having me to give this testimony today. Um, I started uh, working on extreme weather and climate in 1993 uh, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research when I started a postdoc position. I'm currently a professor of environmental studies at the University of Colorado. Now I'm going to give you seven what I call take-home points. And it's important to emphasize that um, each of these points are consistent with what's been reported by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the U.S. Global Change Research Program, and the broader peer-reviewed literature. In fact, I find it fascinating that I'm the ninth witness out of ten, and I'm the first one to invoke the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at a hearing on climate change. Here are my seven points. First, it is misleading and just plain incorrect to claim that disasters associated with hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, or drought have increased on climate timescales either in the United States or globally. It is further incorrect to associate the increase in costs of disasters with the emission of greenhouse gases. Second point, globally, weather-related losses have not increased since 1990 as a proportion of GDP. They've actually decreased by about 25 percent. And insured catastrophe losses have not increased as a proportion of GDP since 1960. Hurricanes, point three, hurricanes have not increased in the U.S. in frequency, intensity, or normalized damage since at least 1900. The same holds for tropical cyclones globally since at least 1970 when we have good data. Fourth, floods have not increased in the U.S. in frequency or intensity since at least 1950. And remarkably, flood losses as a percentage of U.S. GDP have dropped by 75% since 1940. Fifth, tornadoes have not increased in frequency, intensity, or normalized damage since at least 1950. And there's some evidence to suggest they've actually declined. Sixth. Drought has, and here I quote the IPCC, for the most part become shorter, less frequent, and cover a smaller portion of the U.S. over the last century. Globally, and I quote from a recent paper in Nature, there has been little change in drought over the past 60 years. Seventh, now this, these trends being the case, um, it is nonetheless a fact that the absolute cost of disasters will increase significantly in coming years no matter what you think about climate change or a human role in it, simply due to greater wealth and populations exposed in locations uh, that are prone to extremes. So disasters will continue to be an important focus of policy, irrespective of how climate change evolves. Now, let me say, I have a few, few statements in addition to these kind of factual scientific ones. Um, and as we've seen this morning, because the issue is so deeply politicized, um, there's a few points to make so that my testimony is not misconstrued. First, humans do influence the climate system in profound ways, including through the emission of carbon dioxide from the combustion of fossil fuels. And I would point you to the first uh, working group report from the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, for discussion of that. It is true that researchers have detected, and in some cases attributed a human influence um, in measures of climate extremes that go beyond those few that I just mentioned, um, specifically surface temperatures and precipitation trends. The inability to detect and attribute changes in hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, and drought does not mean that human-caused climate change is not real or of concern. It does mean, however, that some activists, politicians, journalists, corporate and government agency representatives, and even scientists who should know better have made claims that are just unsupportable based on evidence and research. It's my view that such false claims undermine the credibility of arguments for action on climate change, and to the extent that these false claims confuse those who are making decisions related to extreme events, they could, in fact, lead to poor decision making. Now, a considerable body of research projects that in the future, various extremes may, in fact, become more frequent or intense as a direct consequence of the human em emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Um, there are exceptions. The IPCC suggests that winter storms may become less likely. Our research and that of others suggest that assuming that these projections are correct, just taking them as uh, true projections of the future, it will be many decades, perhaps longer, before the signal of human-caused climate change can be detected in the statistics of hurricanes. Now, to the extent that the statistical properties of other phenomena, like floods, tornadoes, and droughts, are the same, this, that conclusion will hold. Let me conclude by emphasizing that what I've reported to you today 
is consistent with, what, with what's been reported by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And in my written testimony, I've included direct quotes from that. Um, this is mainstream science. It shouldn't be controversial, uh, supported by peer-reviewed research, uh, and I hope that it's of some use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pelkey. And finally, we'll turn to uh, Dr. Spencer. I will say, Dr. Spencer, that I know that uh, Senator Sessions very much wanted to be here and introduce you, the senator from your home state. And because of the vote and the scheduling mishaps, I think it looks like he uh, would not be able to do that. But I think he would want me to let you know that he was very eager to do that, had asked my permission to do that, and was ready, willing, and able to do that. So uh, you'll have to go forward without his introduction, but I'm sure he wishes you his best. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for the invitation uh, to you and the committee and to uh, Chairman Boxer. First of all, given everything that's been said today, uh, and following on Dr. Pilkey's uh, excellent testimony right now, I want to put everything we've been talking about into a little broader climate context. And this is a, a, a chart that will be uh, submitted as part of the record tomorrow, and at least a few members of the committee might be able to see it. The point here, which I, I will restate orally, is that, yes, we are unusually warm right now, just like we were 1,000 years ago during the medieval warm period, and 2,000 years ago during the Roman warm period. Now, those previous warm periods couldn't have been our fault. The point is, climate varies naturally. Uh, I know the title of today's hearing is, is something like climate change, it's happening today, or something like that. Well, yeah, and it's always changed. Uh, the question is, so what? How much of that change is due to humans? That is a question which I believe I am the only uh, witness today who is actually actively researched and published on. Uh, for instance, uh, we have a new paper that's uh, just been accepted for publication, uh, which looks at not only the warming we've seen in the atmosphere over the last, let's say, 50 years, but also the warming we've seen in the oceans. Dr. Cullen mentioned the importance of not just focusing on the atmosphere, but also looking at the warming in the oceans, and, and she's very correct. And we've done that, and when we take into account how much the deep oceans have warmed since the 1950s, and take into account the effect of El Niños and La Niñas and increasing carbon dioxide and all of the other forcing mechanisms that the, uh, the IPCC uses in their climate model runs, we find that the climate system is relatively insensitive, consistent with the, the big uh, graphic that was shown earlier uh, where it showed that we're not warming nearly as fast as the IPCC climate models suggest we should have been warming. So the point is, a lot of evidence now is, is being amassed, which suggests that the climate system is simply not as sensitive to our addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere as most scientists think it is. Uh, I also want to say, since we're talking about most scientists, you know, I've, I've heard 97%, 98%. There's a recent paper by John Cook and co-authors who looked at thousands of research papers which have been published in the scientific literature to see what fraction, you know, support the scientific consensus on global warming. Well, it turns out that the 97% consensus that they found, I am indeed part of, and Senator Sessions mentioned he would agree with it too. And my associate, John Christie, he agrees with it. In fact, all skeptics that I know of that work in this business all are part of that 97% because the 97% includes people who think humans have some influence on climate. Well, that's a fairly innocuous statement. And that's something that continually annoys me is those of us that are called deniers, it's never actually, uh, I think the D word was actually used by the chairman today. Uh, it's never actually been pointed out. What is it that we deny? Uh, also, you know, this 97%, well, what does the 97% consensus mean? You know, what do all of those people agree to? Well, they agree to something fairly innocuous, and it's something that most of us agree to, that humans must have some influence on climate. The question is, how much? 
and how much influence makes all the difference in the world if you're going to be pace, uh, basing policy decisions, carbon taxes, regulations, legislation, whatever, on them. It makes all the difference in the world uh, exactly how much warming we can expect due to human activities. I'm going to leave it at that, I think, just to point out that uh, some of the statistics that have been um, given today, I think, are only giving half the story. Uh, for instance, uh, Jennifer Francis has, has talked about the decrease in the Arctic sea ice. And I know something about that because I'm the lead scientist on NASA's best instrument for monitoring that decrease in Arctic sea ice. Uh, but what she didn't mention is that Antarctic sea ice over that same 30-year period that we've been monitoring has been increasing. So there's a lot of half-truths in this business. Uh, you can point to some areas that are changing, some areas that are changing in one direction, some are changing in another direction. At some point, we have to ask ourselves, is all of this just mostly part of what the climate system does naturally? Uh, with that, I will end my testimony. Thank you very much, Dr. Spencer. Um, let me begin my uh, questioning. I think we have time to either expand the rounds or have two rounds. How do you want to handle this, David? Two rounds, because I'm asking. Okay, we'll have two rounds so that I can move quickly on. Let me start with um, Dr. Pelkey. Um, I take from your testimony that um, we actually have a fair amount in common. As I understand it, we agree that climate change is happening, correct? That's a yes? Yes. Yes. Um, and we agree that we should both mitigate and adapt in response to that change. Yes. And we both find the IPCC reports credible? Yes. Yes. Um, can we also agree that a body of credible research projects that extreme weather events could increase in frequency and intensity due to man-made carbon dioxide emissions? Respond. Um, yeah. Yes, um, that's certainly the case. And if you look at the literature, you'll find many such projections. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look at my testimony where we actually took climate model output and we asked the question, let's assume that it's true. When would we be able to detect that signal in, we look specifically at, at North Atlantic hurricanes? And the answer, much to our surprise, and it's been replicated now by Kerry Emanuel at MIT with different assumptions, is that it's many decades to centuries before we can say, aha, We've seen that signal. Now, that doesn't mean that climate change, we can forget about it. What it means is that we have to be very careful making strong statements about attribution today because they just rest on a very weak foundation. And um, if you are being a prudent actor and looking forward to protecting your children, your grandchildren, and so forth, um, is it possible that there could be a point particularly with this issue where we're already outside of the bounds that have been uh, our species boundaries for at least 800,000 years. We've been between 170, 300 parts per million for at least 8,000 centuries. And now, poof, we're suddenly out. We're at 400 parts per million. It's climbing. Um, is there a point at which it might be wise to anticipate behavior rather than wait for its signal to emerge. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, I've, I've written on adaptation for an awful long time. And you know, there's a lot of talk now about we're entering a new normal. And if you take a close look at the statistics that I showed you today, one of the concerning things is that we're not even at the old normal. If we had the tornadoes of the 50s or the hurricanes of the uh, 1920s, um, or drought of the 1930s and 1950s, we're not prepared for the old normal. So I think there's a lot of reasons to adapt. What I would suggest is I agree entirely with your comments about being prudent and acting on energy policy and decarbonizing, but there are much, much better justifications for that action than invoking extreme events. For, for a group, you know, climate, people who want action on climate to invoke the importance of science and then very quickly leave that behind and say, you know, this latest disaster, that and so on, they undermine their own the efforts to advocate for action because it's just not supportable. We do know a few things, though, as I understand it. We do know that warmer oceans create stronger storms because of the 
extra heat that's thrown up into the atmosphere off the warmer oceans. Is that an yeah, accepted it, it, phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, it, that independently is, is true, but at the same time, there's countervailing forces like wind shear. I understand. So, so, but at least that part is yeah, true. Yeah, and it's that's also true, true that uh, warmer oceans and warmer air carry more moisture and therefore can lead to more severe precipitation. That's a known scientific proposition, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely true. So when you start to put some of those things together, you can start to draw reasonable conclusions that if the Gulf of Mexico is uh, considerably warmer and it's on the hurricane track, you might want to be careful. Absolutely correct. But again, if we can't det detect that scientifically for decades, um, my thinking is we note that, identify it as a risk, and then we move on to talking about other bases for action. And the, it's interesting that a lot of the focus of the hearing has been on atmospheric models. I'd actually hope to focus on oceans issues, and it's not your fault that you guys were selected as the Republican witnesses. Um, but the other panelists bring a lot of oceans experience. And so if I'm taking you outside of your level of expertise, then, then just let me know. But it does strike me that when you compare the uh, atmospheric data, you really do have to get into issues of climate modeling, and people can pick apart the modeling issues. When it comes to rising sea levels, when it comes to warmer ocean temperatures, and when it comes to ocean acidification, we're not talking about modeling, we're talking about measurement. Isn't that correct? Yes. So, I mean, we know that Newport, Rhode Island, 10 inches higher in sea level since the 30s, we know that has consequences. We know that Narragansett Bay is four degrees warmer mean winter water temperature than it was 30, 40 years ago. We know that that has caused a lot of valuable fish to move out and affected our fishermen in a very unfortunate way. Some of these things, once you look at the oceans, become much clearer and the signal problem begins to uh, dissipate. Don't you agree? I think it's important to separate out looking for a signal of climate change, and I would agree with many of the witnesses who, today who said it's unequivocal that there's human caused climate change, from trying to find that signal in extreme events. Um, we, don't Understood. Look at, we don't look at extreme events to show climate I'm change. over my time, so I'll come back because we'll have another round with the time pressure off, but I do want to yield to the ranking member and be courteous. Thank you, uh, Senator, and thanks to all our panelists. And I want to really continue this discussion because I, I do think it's important that we bring some rigor to the discussion and that we be precise, and that also dovetails with Dr. Spencer's comments. Uh, you know, on the one hand, the title of the hearing is Climate Change, It's Happening Now. Well, I mean, if we take a vote in committee about how many people agree with that, if we take a vote among the witnesses, how many people agree with that, everyone will raise their hand, myself included. Uh, but the suggestion, which was in fact stated several times by the chair, by some witnesses, one of the big themes, one of the big narratives is that extreme weather events are dramatically increasing as a direct result of human carbon related, uh, human related carbon emission. Uh, so again, I think it's important to be precise. So let me focus on that because that is a huge narrative in the last several years. So Dr. Pelkey, since you have focused on that, is there evidence uh, that that statement is true? Extreme weather events are dramatically increasing recently uh, for any reason, and that if they are, it's related to carbon and climate change. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the phrase extreme weather is slippery and, and general enough to encompass many things, and people can invoke that statement and imply something that maybe isn't supported. The reality is that with respect to heat waves, as we heard earlier, and what's been called extreme precipitation, which is a scientific term and often isn't what most people would think of as extreme precipitation, um, yes, there has been a documented increase in those phenomena, and there have been attribution studies uh, that link it to increasing greenhouse gases. Um, but when it comes to the most costly and visible disasters, hurricanes, floods, drought, and tornadoes, as I discussed, there is not presently attribution or even detection of increasing trends with respect to those phenomena. There may be in the future, but there's not presently. Okay. And that directly relates to pictures of Superstorm Sandy, discussion of Hurricane Katrina, et cetera. Let me um, bring up these charts again because they're yours. The data is not yours, but they're from your testimony. 
And if you can just briefly walk us through what each chart represents and what do you think it says. So heat waves. So that one's not from my testimony. Perhaps that's Oh, sorry. Me. All right. I thought it was. This is, uh, well, well, let me comment on this. This is EPA data with regard to heat waves uh, over many decades. Let's go to the next one. Uh, drought. Yeah, that one is also not from my testimony. I do refer to drought, uh, but since the IPCC in 2007 came out with its report, the community has recognized that the phenomena of drought is more complicated than originally thought, and there are trends in some places of increasing drought and in other places of decreasing drought, but overall, over the planet, the conclusion has been that over 60 years, there's been no trend one way or the other. Okay. Next chart is wildfires. Yeah, this one doesn't appear in my testimony either. Um, it's, it's very plausible uh, that there could be an, a, a signal of human-caused climate change in Western wildfires uh, in particular. Um, there's a number of causal steps in that chain that need to be connected, and it's, it's logical, but doing convincing attribution is made complicated because humans have been so deeply interfering with the Western ecosystems that, um, according to a recent study in, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, climate and uh, societal behavior and fire have all been decoupled over about a century. Okay. And hurricane landfalls in the U.S. Yeah, this does come from my testimony. And remarkably, um, over a century, there has actually been a slight decrease in the number of hurricane landfalls. Presently, we're in the longest stretch with no Category 3 or stronger hurricanes making landfall in the U.S. Uh, ever recorded. Now, that goes back to 1900, and the data before that's even less. The state of Florida is in the longest stretch without being hit by a hurricane. So the idea that we're in some sort of um, enhanced hurricane regime, um, it sets the stage for setting the false expectations. We are not. We are actually uh, been pretty lucky in recent years. And this is the global equivalent, global cyclone landfalls, which is basically hurricanes, typhoons, et cetera, global landfalls. Is that the same story, basically? Yeah, that's a study we did where we added up all of the landfalls globally, um, and the data is good in 1970, and there's no trend globally either. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me ask if any of the other witnesses would care to respond to those charts and that data. Starting over here at the left, Dr. Francis, you want to give it a share of your views? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of information presented there, but um, I think I wanted to reiterate something that Dr. Cullen said, and that is that when you're looking at uh, trends like heat waves and droughts and floods, you cannot take an area the size of the United States, average over the entire area, and then present trends based on that, because there's huge regional differences. And so if you, you know, average over the east being wetter and the west being drier, you get no signal. So what I saw there was an average over the United States. Again, that trend does not reflect what is really happening in a regional basis. Um, in terms of um, the hurricanes, I'm not a hurricane expert, but I think focusing on landfalling hurricanes also is a rather um, not quite realistic way to go about it because, for example, the last two years there have been um, a large, lar much, m many more hurricanes than in a typical year over the last two summers in the, in the Atlantic, and for whatever reason, very few of them actually made landfall in the United States, but there were way more hurricanes than normal. So I think the, the statistics as presented there uh, present a rather misleading picture. Let me um, turn to Dr. Spencer, and let me first ask a kind of unrelated question, Doctor. Do you uh, believe that the theory of creation actually has a much better scientific basis than the theory of evolution? <laughs> and why are we going in this direction? <laughs> because it's something you've said, and I just wanted to see if you still believe it. Uh, I believe that evolutionary theory is mostly religion. It is naturalistic, but my faith is not strong enough to believe that everything happened by accident. I mean, there's a lot of work out there that's shown that you cannot statistically combine all of the elements that are contained in a DNA molecule uh, by chance 
over however many billions of years you want to invoke or over how many uh, how much known universe there is with all of the matter in it so what I'm saying is some areas of science deal a lot more with faith than with known science and so I'm open to alternative explanations and do you still believe that the theory of creation actually has a much better scientific basis than the theory of evolution to be specific I think I think I could be put into a debate with someone on the other side and I think I could give more science supporting that life is created than they could support with evidence that life evolved through natural random processes. So yes. Okay. You have, in your testimony, you have a uh, graph that I think we've seen a lot of versions of during the course of the day, um, which shows a average trend line, the black line, that is the average of all the other lines, which are various Yes, those climate are 70, 73 of the latest IPCC climate models. And then you have your own uh, balloon and satellite data sets, which are indicated by the various marks uh, running below right, that. Right, those big blobs are the observations. There's a total of six data sets there, one of which is ours. The other they, five are not ours. And they all come from the tropical mid-troposphere? Yeah, this is all tropical mid-troposphere, that's right. So they're all from the tropics and they're all from above 5,000 roughly? Well, it's actually a, a deep layer. A it's a deep layer of the atmosphere from the surface to, let's say, 10 or 12 kilometers altitude. So it's a bulk measure of the tropical atmosphere. Okay. Um, let me show you a second graph which looks rather similar to it. Other side, upside down. And was presented to this committee by uh, Dr. John Christie, who I believe is a collaborator and co-author of yours. Do you recognize that? Yes. And that shows what appears to be the same data set going along the bottom line, the same average, but it also shows an additional data set in the middle, which includes um, surface temperature readings. Mm -hmm. And it would appear to me that w the surface temperature readings, when you add them, actually are far closer to the average than the data set that you selected, or the yeah, data the set surface, that you selected. Yeah, the surface right? temperatures appear to be closer. Uh, the reason why we emphasize deep tropospheric temperatures is because they aren't subject to certain kinds of errors. For instance, urban heat island effects. Uh, also, our satellite measurements are the only truly global measurements. That's for global. Ours are the only truble, truly global measurements because then, they sample all of the, the global atmosphere. And then let me show a third uh, graph, which I think is fairly um, common in the literature on this, that I believe was produced by Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading, but is uh, a common display, I gather, in the, commu in the scientific community. And that uh, shows from an even broader set of uh, data sources the match between observed and um, modeled projections. Have you seen that before? Uh, I have not seen this one. Okay. Um, but it's certainly apparent that as you go through those sets, the data set that you've selected is the one that is most divergent from the model data, and that as you add further observations, the trends close rather than separate, correct? Ah, uh, Senator, I can turn that around and tell you that usually what we see from the IPCC are comparisons which are the closest. And it takes someone like me to come along and say, all right, you're not showing all of the data. So we're just trying to give some equal time to the other half of the story that isn't being told. But you'll concede that in this graph, there's more data than in the data sets, the six data sets that you incorporated in your testimony. That's just 
factual, correct? More data? No, I would not concede that. All right. Can I ask Dr. Francis to comment on this? Or Dr. Uh, I don't know who else would like to, but. Sure, I'll take a stab at it. So um, we who have used model output for many years for various things are as aware as anyone that they're not perfect. We know they're not perfect. But they get the general sense of change correct. Some of them do a darn good job. And there are variables that, in fact, they project are changing slower than the real world. So in fact, they're more conservative than the actual change that we're observing in the real world. Um, the sea ice loss is a classic example. Um, most of the models um, have, when they're run in hindcast mode or looking back at um, the real world and what's happened, are not able to capture um, the speed of change of the sea ice loss in the Arctic. So I think it's very possible to look through the model output and find problems. But overall, the models do an amazingly good job of, a, of simulating what is an incredibly complex system, this climate system that involves the oceans and the atmosphere and the ice and the biosphere and the soil moisture, and coming up with very close representation of what the real world has undergone. And of course, into the future, there are so many assumptions about what's going to happen in terms of future emissions of carbon dioxide and uh, future technology um, changes and things like that. So, um, Now, there has been a testimony here that we are, and I've said it, I think it's fairly commonly known, that we are outside boundaries of carbon concentration in our atmosphere that uh, have persisted for somewhere between 800,000 years and many millions of years, minimum 800,000 years. So um, if carbon pollution has forced us outside of those boundaries, and we are now in unknown territory for our planet without going back into geologic time, certainly unknown territory for our planet while it's been inhabited by our species, um, it's foreseeable that there's going to be some uncertainty about the modeling. We have never been here before, have we? That's, it's very possible, although the models are based on physics, the laws of physics, and the laws of physics are not changing. We understand what happens to the Earth when you increase greenhouse gases. That has been known for generally. 100 years, generally. But if that there is a said, specific short-term cooling trend, that is driven by changes in the ocean right. and the changing patterns of the ocean and the current flows and the increasing absorption, that's something that 10, 15 years ago would have been a pretty tough thing to try to model exactly. You can't model it exactly. The models have those kinds of variability built into them, but to have the changes happen in the ocean exactly the same year in the model as they happen in the real world, you know they, to create these model um, graphs like this, they run the same model many times to create what they call ensembles, because the, the models have natural variability in them just like the real world does. So each of those runs of the model doesn't necessarily um, correspond to what the real world has done, because we only have one um, run of the real world to compare to those. Okay, let me interrupt. I see Senator Sessions here. Let me apologize to the Senator. I went ahead with uh, Dr. Spencer's testimony, but I did let him know that you had wanted to be here when his time came to introduce him, and I will yeah. uh, yield to you the uh, 11, 10 minutes that you used. <laughs> there was nobody else here, so I figured I, I wasn't know. inconveniencing well, anybody. Um, somebody else is here now. Well, if you just look at that chart, it shows that it's uh, dropping down below the modeling levels. Uh, Dr. Spencer, let's look at this chart, and let's get clear about what the chart says. Uh, the, the red line does not represent one or two models, does it? Some no, to remember, it, it models. represents the average of all the IPCC models included, and I want to emphasize the reason why the average is important. The IPCC base its bottom line conclusions basically on that average. Okay? So that's so the, the red line represents what the IPCC predicts for the future. So back in 1995, or well, in recent times, uh, 
the models were predicting a rather continuing increase in temperature because CO2 continues to increase in the world and whatever other factors they use, uh, that made sense to those computer models. Well, even Kevin Trenberth, who is, you know, on the other end of the spectrum from me, has admitted, you know, that we don't know why it stopped warming and it's a travesty that we don't know. Uh, if I can return to the chart that Senator Whitehouse presented as evidence of supposed agreement between the observations. Uh, the one behind you, Senator Whitehouse. This one over here. Okay. Uh, would you admit that that chart shows that the observations are now approaching the bottom of the full range of climate model projections? I think the chart speaks for itself, and like this chart, it continues to show rising temperatures, maybe not at the level of the average, but that clearly is not a flat line from where they depart upwards. It has crawled, I can't, it's well above the 0 0.2. It is more than halfway to 0 0.4. That to me is an increase, not And a, I don't think anyone has claimed that there, that there is a zero change. But there's a big difference between a tiny change and a huge change. And since we have policies that are being discussed that are going to be based on that red line, I think we need to consider the possibility that we need to go back and figure out what's wrong with the models before we start basing policies on models which produce at least two times as much warming as we've observed in nature and possibly three times as much warming. Dr. Spencer, you and Dr. Christie, by utilizing satellite data, hasn't, hasn't that gained uh, respect worldwide as a more accurate, um, and a lot of scientists agree that that's the best way to uh, identify global temperature change? Well, we need all of these data sets. We, we need the satellite data set, partly because it's the only truly global data set. It also measures up where uh, we can see other things happening. We think what's going on in the upper atmosphere is that it's not warming as fast because something called positive water vapor feedback isn't happening. Now these models amplify warming. At least twice the warming that occurs in all of these climate models is because they increase water vapor throughout the whole atmosphere in response to the warming and it, and it about doubles the warming. And this lack of warming up in the free atmosphere to us suggests that on these climate timescales there isn't positive water vapor feedback or that it's very weak. And so that's one reason why, another reason why we use the satellite data is it tells us more about the climate system than just the surface. The surface is just, you know, a thin layer, uh, six feet above, above the surface. And there's so many things that can affect that, uh, winds and things. This is a bulk measurement of the heat content of the atmosphere that we think has more physical meaning uh, for understanding the climate system. Just to get this straight, the economists said over the past 15 years, air temperatures at the Earth's surface have been flat. Um, is that disputed uh, or, or is that generally accepted today? I think it depends on the surface temperature data set that they're talking about. There are different, just like there are different satellite data sets, there are different weather balloon data sets, there are different surface temperature data sets, and I think one or more of the surface temperature data sets show in the last 10 to 15 years a temperature change which isn't statistically different from zero. Um, you know, maybe there is a slight warming or a slight cooling depending on the data set. I'm not, I'm not an expert on all those. You know, but we're, we're mincing words when what we should be emphasizing is we're not getting anywhere near the warming that the models have predicted. To me, that's, that's the, the take-home message. Well, thank you for that. And I think it should give us cause to, to analyze and think about that. Uh, it, it's pretty obvious also that there are long-term variations in temperature that have occurred naturally over the centuries. Is that correct? Do, do you right. While you, while you weren't here, um, I asked to enter into the record this, this plot of uh, of temperatures over the last 2,000 years, which suggests that previous warm periods that, uh, you know, our current warm period uh, may not be exceptional compared to the medieval warm period or the Roman warm period. In other words, global warming and global cooling 
happens almost every century. Well, they happen for some reason, and we may be finding uh, that CO2 will impact global temperatures, uh, but they've been occurring without huge increases in CO2, it seems to me. Well, I just find it very unscientific for scientists to claim that there are these past periods of warming which, well, we really don't know what caused them. They obviously weren't due to people. But the current period of warming we know is due to increasing CO2. It just logically does not make sense. Now, theoretically, I can admit I do expect some warming from CO2. But as I've mentioned, my primary area of research is trying to determine exactly how much. And right now, the state of that science is I don't think we can say how much of our current warmth is due to human CO2 emissions versus natural processes. In one of our last hearings, I don't know if you have this, uh, these numbers in your mind or at hand, but earlier the question, the statement was made that we've had record high temperatures in the last few years and an unusual number of record high temperatures. As I understand the data, uh, there's quite a, many more record high temperatures during the Dust Bowl times of the 30s. Is yeah, that, 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 that chart was shown maybe while you weren't here uh, that shows that by far most of the high temperature records that were set in the United States were set in the 1930s. And I don't know what we're doing today so far in Washington, D.C., but I don't think we're going to hit 103 degrees today, which is the record high for this date in Washington, which was set in 1887. <laughs> well, one of the things that's confusing us a bit is they use the heat index and the humidity index and makes the numbers go up and the Weather Channel's ratings go up. Uh, and we hear all about storms because we hear, hear about every one of them. But uh, uh, Dr. Pilkey, is that the way? Uh, you have just demolished this idea, it seems to me, from your research, that we're having extraordinary increases in storms of all kinds, floods, droughts. I remember that Kingston Trio song, they're riding in Africa, they're starving in Spain, the whole world is full of strife, and Texas needs rain. So, what is it, would you comment a little further on uh, uh, your finding objectively with regard to storms? I just had the numbers from NOAA that show there hasn't been an increase but really a decline in hurricanes and Dr. Culler's own statement to us that there's no evidence to indicate that EF4, EF5 tornadoes like the ones that devastated a large swath of Moore, Oklahoma in May are becoming more frequent or more severe. Close quote. Do uh, you have any comments on that? Yeah, I'll just say that the, the, this is one area of research and science that really shouldn't be controversial because, um, I mean, hurricanes, you don't miss them. They're big, and you count them up. It's just math. And um, I said earlier, and I'll repeat this, that, that if, if one wants to invoke the importance of science in these debates, um, you're not allowed to, to say, well, I like this science, but I don't like that science. And uh, the fact of the matter is um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change did a big report, uh, reported out in 2012, um, that looked globally at extreme events um, and summarized these, datas, uh, these data. Now looking forward, there are projections there may be more extreme events, um, but the good news is we're, we're monitoring, we're detecting, and simply statistically, um, the, one of the last places you would want to look to see the signal of climate change is extreme events because they are, they're rare. Uh, they don't occur all the time, and so it takes a long time to understand the statistics. To the extent there's large variability, that makes it even more difficult. So I would say that um, you know the, the images of Katrina uh, and, and the like, um, you know, they get a lot of attention, and the media focuses on it. But it, it takes the scientific community down a path where um, pretty quickly they depart from what you can say based on data and analyses, and that's that doesn't help the discussion, and uh, it, it doesn't help certainly claims that are supposed to be grounded in science. And then, uh, I would just say I, I appreciate Dr. Spencer coming, and if, to the extent to which he believes this is a created universe, uh, we share that common belief. I am um, delighted that the witnesses were here, and I want to thank them for their uh, testimony. I do believe that NASA stands by its uh, data that shows that 
the 12 warmest years on record since 1880 all happened in the last 15 years. I wasn't here for the Dust Bowl, but uh, certainly it happened after 1880, and uh, 12 out of 15 is pretty serious uh, information, and I think, I tend to believe that NASA knows what they're talking about, particularly when they're driving a rover around on the surface of Mars. That's not a small achievement. Um, and I'd close by noting one other thing, which is that the discussion in this panel uh, from the Republican side has largely been about the atmospheric issues and has largely been about the modeling of atmospheric issues and particularly looking at tropical, tropospheric, atmospheric data. And the focus of the hearing, I had hoped, was to be on oceans. Because once you get into the oceans, a lot of the modeling issues go away. We actually measure ocean acidification. We actually measure ocean temperatures. We actually measure sea level rise. And if all of the focus is on areas of technical dispute and we're blind to what is visibly and measurably happening all around us, I think we're going to miss the most important signal. So let me pay a particular thank you to the oceans experts who came in today. And if the uh, other side wants to bring Ocean's witnesses at some point, I'd be delighted to continue this discussion. But we're really having two panels. We've got an oceans panel, which seems to be pretty unanimous, and we have an atmospherics and economics panel. Um, and I think, to me, I'm from the ocean state. It matters a lot to Rhode Island when the sea level is 10 inches higher than it was in our last big, big, big crusher hurricane. When we get our next one, that's going to make a big difference. It makes a big difference to me when fishermen can't catch winter flounder any longer in Narragansett Bay because it's moved offshore and our lobstermen have to drive twice as far as uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Leinen mentioned when these fishermen have to drive farther to find their catch. It's not just a fuel burn. It's not just an expense. It's not just time. Fishermen have a dangerous job. They go out into a dangerous place. And the more time they have to spend for their catch out on the ocean, the more uh, at risk they are. So it's really, really important to Rhode Island that we get this right and that we listen to the signals from the ocean. So thank you very much. The Could I say one, one thing on, in regard to Dr. Spencer's background? He was senior scientist for climate studies at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. During his tenure at the, the center, he and Dr. John Christie received NASA's Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal for developing innovative methods for precise monitoring of Earth temperatures via, uh, via Earth orbiting satellites. Uh, it's regarded as a major advancement in our ability to monitor climate fluctuations. Uh, and uh, he's been engaged in a lot of other important scientific endeavors. Thank you. The um, chairman has already announced that the hearing record will close at 10 o'clock tomorrow, but further questions can be in for the usual EPW two weeks. So with that, I thank the witnesses, I thank those who attended, and adjourn the hearing.